Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have this time that we can come together this morning and open up your word, but also that we may embark on looking at this topic to understand it in a right manner or understand it a little more fully <clears throat> as we open the pages of Scripture. Lord, we pray most earnestly that you may touch our hearts and minds, you may give us a, fr a freedom of thought and understanding, that we may see the wisdom of God and understand it, and that it would be able to be applied to our lives day by day. I ask for your blessing that you may be with me, give me a clear mind, and also the physical ability to present your word and that the word of truth may be exalted above all else in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. We live in a world that is coming to a close. Mm. And the reality is, we know it's coming to a close. And as Christians, or Seventh-day Adventists more particularly, we know and understand that Christ is coming back. But we know He's coming back for a certain type of people. And with the world that we live in today, with what is taking place not only in the secular world but in the religious world we know that time is short but we also know that god's word gives us the understanding that we need to be preparing for the end of time and knowing it and i've preached a sermon on this knowing and understanding prophecy is not going to save you it may give you an urgency and an understanding of what is going to come upon the world and how soon it is to come upon the world but it is the relationship with Jesus Christ that is actually going to bring about that salvation and also prepare you to stand during that time and that is what we want to look at today one aspect of the issue of salvation the last sermon I preached yes the last sermon that I preached we did a broad overview of salvation Today we're going to look at one topic, but I want to look at that topic primarily also in relation to the Holy Spirit, in relation to us. So, if you turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we'll start in verse 3. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3. And the Bible says, For this is the will of God. That's very plain language. It's emphatic. Paul is stating to us, This is the will of God. It goes on to say, even your sanctification. And then it continues to go on and say what you should abstain from. But it's interesting, God's will for us is actually that we would live a sanctified life. That's His will. Verse 7 continues that thought by saying, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. And the word holiness there is the identical word for sanctification in verse 3. See, God hasn't called us to live an unclean or an unholy life. He wants us to live a holy life. It's His will for us that we would actually live a sanctified life, meaning that we would live a life that is totally, 100% dedicated and consecrated for His use. God's use. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be in a monastery like a monk and pray 24-7. That's not just God's use. That your life would be available for Him, totally dedicated to Him and consecrated to Him in whatever area that you work in. Whatever area that you have your spare time in. Whatever area of anything in your life 
it can be dedicated and consecrated to God and that God can use you in that position. And we had a good example of that with the hospital. Made available at the right place at the right time. In sickness, God can use someone to touch someone else. This is what we're meaning with practical Christianity is essentially what we're looking at. A sanctified life, a life that is totally dedicated to God, totally consecrated to Him for His use, for His purpose, for His will. In every area of your life or wherever you might, may find yourself to be. This is what we're talking about. But there is a good reason of why says God says that it's my will that you would live this type of life. It's my will that I have called you to live a life of holiness and not uncleanness or uncleanliness. Let's go to 1 Peter and find out why. 1 Peter chapter 1. These are very familiar verses. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15. It says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or conduct, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Mm -hmm. See, God, God's will for us is that we would live a holy life, that we would live a sanctified life. That's his will. That's what he's called us to. Why? Because he himself is holy. And he's coming back for a holy people. Therefore, we should reflect His character in our lives. We must be preparing our characters to reflect His character because He's coming back for a holy people, because He's a holy God. <clears throat> and only holiness is going to stand in His presence, not sin. And I hope this becomes very clear as we come down through this subject. Our lives, our conduct, our characters should reflect the holiness or the character of God. That's why he's called us to a life of holiness, because he himself is holy. Heaven is a place of holiness, not a place of uncleanness, holiness, cleanliness. Mm -hmm. But how is this possible? How is this possible? When we start looking at this, well, firstly, and very simply, which is at the basis of all of this, let's go to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Acts 26, and this is Paul recounting what Christ said to him on the road to Damascus. Acts 26, let's start reading in verse 18. 17, he, Paul is told he's going to be sent to the Gentiles. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. Verse 18 says, To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. That's repentance, to turn. Turning from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan under God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That's justification. Justification, being made righteous, incorporates forgiveness, being pardoned, washed, cleansed. And it says, and inheritance among them which are sanctified, how? Okay. By faith which is in me. At the basis of sanctification is faith. We're not sanctified by works. We're not sanctified by our own deeds, our own actions. No, we are sanctified by faith. So if faith is not exercised, there will never be a sanctified life. Because sanctification comes by faith. Mm. So therefore, that comes then to us, not to God. He's given everyone a measure, of, a measure of faith. The Bible makes that very clear. But it is up to us to actually exercise that faith in order to live this type of life. We are the ones that must choose to exercise faith. Mm. God wants us to, that's what he's called us to, but he can't exercise it for you. You must believe. 
And the Bible says in John chapter 17, verse 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. See, friends, sanctification <coughs> takes faith, yes? But faith in what? Faith in God's word that sanctifies the life. There is no sanctification outside of truth. It's emphatic. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. No truth, no sanctified life. Impossible. You can have faith in whatever you want, but if it's not in the truth, you will never have a sanctified life. Your, you, the character of God will never be reproduced in your life. There is no sanctification outside of truth. Friends, and I meet so many people that get so discouraged and give up because of this reason. Now, what do I mean by that? It's because they misunderstand this reason. They say the Christian experience is not working for me. It's not working in any way. It just seems to, I don't know, I don't have that peace. I don't have that joy. I don't seem to do what's right, all that sort of stuff. So then you start going down and looking at the life. It's like, well, what are you actually reading? What are you watching? Where are you going? What are you listening to? That's why it's not working. That's why it's not working. Friends, all the fiction, the novels, all this sort of stuff, that's not going to sanctify your life. All this television rubbish and things like that is not going to sanctify your life. All this worldly music and all those sorts of things, even a lot of Christian music these days, is not going to sanctify your life. Places of amusement that you go to and things like that, that's not going to sanctify your life unless it is based in truth. And exalts the truth and keeps the mind focused on the truth. Then, by faith, it will sanctify the life. This is why it's not working for many Christians today is because why? Because they are living completely outside of truth. What they're listening to, where they're going, what they're doing. What they're reading is actually drawing them away from this, not to it. It's not elevating truth. It's bringing truth down. But there's only sanctification within the boundaries of truth. See, there is, an, there is a personal evaluation that must take place. Remember, the scripture says, search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Search me. Because I can't search myself. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I'm going to look at myself and go, yeah, well, it seems to match. But if we allow God to search us and ask God to search us, he's going to truly reveal to us exactly what is out of harmony with this. Not with what, what is out of harmony with what we're listening to. Out of harmony of this, the truth. This is where the sanctification is found. God's Word. It has a sanctifying effect on the life. Mm. Therefore, if that is the case, somewhere along the line, the truth must be incorporated into the life. It has to be. It has to be. Does the Word of God have power... In the sense of, does it have self-fulfilling power to accomplish exactly what it says it will do? Yes. Yes, it does. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. Yes. As the rain comes down, the snow, so forth, yes. water's there, doesn't return. It actually accomplishes what it, it is sent to do. It gives bread to the eater. All those sorts of things. So is the Word of God that is sent to us. See, faith in the Word trusting that the word will do exactly what it says trusting in the promises of god and taking them as as a reality incorporating it into the life in that way making that choice to actually believe and trust that god's word will do exactly what it says the bible says also to let the word of god dwell in you richly allow it to to work in the life there is life in the word spiritual life the very life of God. It's the living word. Not all these other things. It 
So we have faith. Faith must be exercised and trust that God's word will fulfill itself in the life, allowing it to dwell richly in the life. Exercising faith in that which sanctifies you. But where do we go from here? Let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, notice verse 2. Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Notice what it says next. Through sanctification of what? Spirit. Of the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Notice firstly. Through sanctification of what? So is there any sanctification outside of the operation of the Holy Spirit in your life? Come on, speak to me. The verse tells you. Sanctification through? Through the Spirit. You take the Spirit out of the Holy Spirit out of the equation, is there going to be any sanctified life? No. Impossible. Remember, he's also called the Spirit of Truth. He's the one that leads and guides you into all truth. The truth sanctifies. But notice the end result or the fruit that is born is obedience. Obedience to what? To the truth. Notice verse 22. Same chapter, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in doing what? Obeying the truth. But remember, the obedience is a fruit of the Spirit-filled life. And therefore, that Spirit-filled life that brings about the fruit of obedience purifies the life. Not you purifying the life, exercising faith in God's Word, taking it for exactly what it says, that it will do exactly what it says, and trusting in the Holy Spirit to work through His power to help you to be obedient to the Word, and therefore purifying the life. Without the Holy Spirit's presence, without having that connection, there will never be a life of holiness. Without faith, there will not be. Without the Word of God, there won't be. Without the Holy Spirit, there still won't be. You must have all. For how are you going to test the Spirit? Or which Spirit you have? By the truth. You must have all. It's all or it's nothing. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives the enabling power to actually obey the truth and thus have a life that is purified. If there is no obedience, it is because there is no spirit-filled life. There is no sanctification. But how does that work? I mean, it's all good and fine to say, well, yeah, you need to trust in God's Word, you need to trust in the promises, you need to lay all those other things aside, you need to trust and ask for the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will do this. Yeah, but how does that work? How does that work? Well, the best chapter to read on how that works is Romans chapter 8. Mm -hmm. Let's go there. Romans chapter 8. That's why it's called the operation of the Spirit. Because all is useless without the Holy Spirit's presence in one's life. It won't work. Romans chapter 8. Notice. Starting in verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity or at variance to God or against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Notice, firstly, we have a problem. The carnal mind, the flesh, the fleshly nature, the sinful nature. 
Does it want to actually obey the truth? No. Let me even go further. Can it obey the truth? No. It can't. It's emphatic. It's not subject to the law. Neither indeed can be. It cannot obey the truth and it will not obey the truth regardless of anything else. The, the sinful nature will not go, yeah, I want to be obedient, I love it, it's great, it's wonderful, and I'm just going to obey. It doesn't happen. Why? Well, let's go back to verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. flesh. If the flesh is in control, you're going to have... Or you're going to do what the flesh wants you to do. You have the fruit of the flesh. Which, if you want to see that, go to Galatians chapter 5. Fruit of the Spirit. And you have the works of the flesh. And it's going to end in death. Not life. So what you have then, is that the carnal mind or the sinful nature cannot actually obey the truth. Why? Because it's going to obey what it wants to do. The rest of verse 5 says, But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So notice, the problem we have. We have a problem that is directly related to the flesh. Something has to happen to the flesh in order for us to be able to follow the Spirit. But I want you to notice something. Very simple, but very, very, very important which is where a lot of people get it wrong as well. You can't follow the Spirit in the flesh. And you won't follow the flesh in the Spirit. The two are completely opposite. You are in the flesh, you won't do the things of the Spirit. You're in the Spirit, you will not do the things of the flesh. You can't have both at the same time. But friends, that's what we want. And that's what we're even beginning to teach. You can have both. You can be a Christian and can sin until Christ comes. Hang on. My Bible says that the flesh, those that are in the flesh are going to do the things of the flesh, but those that are in the Spirit are going to do the things of the Spirit. So the Spirit's going to lead you down a path of sin and then save you in the end. Friends, this is what we're teaching. This is what we're teaching. This is what the Protestantism, Protestant world at large is teaching as well. You can sin until Christ comes. The Holy Spirit's going to lead you in a path of sin, and He will save you in the end. That is what this sin until Christ come teaches. You're in the Spirit, but that's okay. You're going to sin. But it's alright. No, no. At that point, there is a choice that is being made where you have chosen to let go of the Spirit and cling to the flesh. And the flesh has led you into the path of sin. Not the Spirit. We'll look at that a little bit more as we go through. The two are completely opposite to each other. You can't have one and the other at the same time. It is either one or the other. That's the reality. And if, it is, if it's the flesh, you'll do the things of the flesh. If it's the Spirit, you're not going to do the things of the flesh. You're going to do the things of the Spirit. What the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you into, which is truth, obedience, sanctified life. So we have a problem with this flesh, the carnal mind. Something has to happen to it in order for us to be able to be connected to the Holy Spirit, as in have a Spirit-filled and led life. Well, what has to happen? Go to chapter 6. I'm trying to keep this simple, very, very simple. Romans 6. Should be just back a page or so, depending on your Bible. Romans chapter 6. Mm -hmm. 
We're actually starting with verse 4. I wasn't going to read verse 4, but we'll read verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Just very quickly, notice there needs to be a death. Then there needs to be a burial. Then there is a resurrection. Then there is a new life. If you want to have the new life, there needs to be a resurrection. If you're going to have a resurrection, well, someone needs to be dead and buried. Don't bury life, people do. We call that murder. Okay, so there has to be a death. There has to be a burial, which is putting completely out of sight in order for a resurrection to a new life. Well, verse 6, what has to die? Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, which means not serving sin, it means newness of life. New life. See, there is a problem with the flesh. We're married to it. We're one flesh with the flesh. The only way that you can sever yourself from that is through death. You can't get married to Christ unless the flesh dies. The Holy Spirit isn't going to be filling the life if the flesh is alive. The flesh has to die. That old way of life, that old sinful life, it must be put to death. It must be laid in the grave in order to have a new life. In order to have and do the things of the Spirit instead of the things of the flesh. The flesh, self, the old sinful life needs to die in order to create a separation so we can actually be linked to Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to dwell in our lives. But who's going to do that for us? Who's going to do that? Is God just going to go, yeah, yeah, look, I know the intentions of your heart, it's okay, bang, there you go, it's done. Everything's great, it's fine, you're all good now. You're in the Spirit. Well, that's what the Pentecostals would have us believe. Oh, just come down the front, receive the Spirit. Give them a push to encourage them to fall backwards. Oh, I'm serious. Is that just how it works? No. Well, we've already been told that the flesh needs to die. But how is that going to take place? What does that mean? How do we get to that? Let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. <coughs> Matthew 26. Notice verse 39. Speaking of Christ, it says, And he went a little farther, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Christ's flesh did not want to drink the cup. Didn't want to. He says, if there is another way, this is what Christ is saying. If there is another way, let it be done. That's what I want. See, friends, when temptation comes, you can look it up in James chapter 1, verse 14. When temptation comes, the reason why it is a temptation is because it is enticing. It draws you out. The flesh actually re reacts, as in the sinful nature reacts and goes, oh, that looks really good. Mm. I could do that. I could have that. I want that. Mm. It also goes for when you get angry. Passion is wanting to express itself. <coughs> and the flesh is going, yeah, this is, you, you've got to let that out. Got to let that out. You'll feel so much better when you do. Yeah, but what about all the repercussions? The bad example that you've given of Christ. 
It's enticing. It pulls a cord in the heart of the flesh and it wants to go out after it. That's why it is a temptation. It's tempting. It's enticing you to do what is wrong, to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And it's at that point in time that we are faced with the position of what Christ was faced in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is what I want to do. My flesh is screaming out that I want to be indulged. I want to fulfill that lust. I want to go after this. But it must come to that point of where you need to make a choice or a decision. God's not going to make that decision for you. He's not a God of force. Yes, the flesh needs to be crucified. But that takes place when one surrenders their life to Christ. Well, what does that mean? Not what I want to do. Not what my flesh is screaming out to do. But what your will for me is right now, God. That's what I choose above this. We have the freedom to choose. That choice is going to determine who you are going to give in to. Which means who you are going to surrender to, to yield to, to give way to. The flesh is only going to be crucified if you say, Lord, not what I want. Not what my flesh is screaming out for, but what is your will for me in this instance right now? That's where surrender takes place. So you don't find anything like this when Christ goes through the judgment hall. You don't find anything like this when Christ is hanging upon the cross. There is no decision that is made, in one sense, in the judgment hall with Christ or upon the cross. Why? Because he settled that in the Garden of Gethsemane. He crucified the flesh in the Garden of Gethsemane and said, no, it's the Father's will and the Father's will only. That decision wasn't made on the cross. It was made right here. That's why he went to the cross. Because he made up his mind there. Father, okay. I don't want to. My flesh is shrinking back from it. But I'm not going that way. I'm choosing your will. And I know your will means the cross. That's what I accept. He accepted that there. It's the same with us, friends. It's the same with us. The flesh must be crucified. But that crucifying of the flesh is based upon your choice. What the flesh wants to do or what God's will is for you at that moment. And friends, that is something that takes place throughout the entire day. Every instance, every temptation, that choice needs to be made. This is sanctification. Am I going to obey the flesh and give in to that? Or am I going to give in to God and trust His Word? And that the Spirit can actually bring about sanctification in my life and be that power source that makes the Word of God alive in my life and helps me and enables me to actually do what the Word of God says. That's the choice that's made. And that choice is made by faith. It's made by faith. But that is every instance that we are tempted. That's the process that has to be gone through. Uh, so what happens then? Let's go to Romans chapter 8. I should have told you to hold your finger there. Romans chapter 8. See, friends, this isn't even looking at the convicting power of the Spirit that even brings you into that position of where you're convicted of, I need to make a choice. That's a whole lot of other sermons in and of itself. Without the Holy Spirit, we're lost. We're absolutely lost. Verse 2, Romans chapter 8. 
It says, for the law of the spirit, notice, for the law of the spirit of life. life. Where? In Christ. In Christ Jesus hath made me, <coughs> what's the next word? Free. Now, what does it mean to be free? Unencum it unencumbered. Unencumbered. It also means and implies that at some stage you were bound. bound. In bondage, not free. Okay? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Sin and death. Isn't that the path that the flesh takes? Mm -hmm. But the law of the spirit of life. The spirit has life giving power in unity with Jesus Christ to actually free you from that bondage of the flesh that leads you down the path of sin and eventually death. So when you actually surrender and actually make that choice, the Holy Spirit brings in this life-giving power and releases you from the power of the flesh that is being enticed and is wanting to pull you in the opposite direction. Without the Spirit, that's impossible. Friends, I can't get down to the super nitty nitty gritty, but you can see and understand that the Word of God can get very, very deep in the issue of how do we actually even live a sanctified life through the operation of the Spirit the life giving Spirit united with Jesus Christ we can be freed as we surrender to that conviction of that which is right and the will of God that's what frees us It actually frees us from being bondage to sin and death, and therefore in freeing us from being bondage to that, it enables us to actually be obedient to God. Because if you're naturally freed from that, then you're going to follow this path. It's not, I've been freed from this, but I'm still bound to it. That's sin until Christ comes. I've been freed, freed through the Spirit, but I, I still give in to it all the time. There's, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. Very, very wrong with that. But that's not all. That's not all. If you go to verse 13 of chapter 8, notice what else that the Holy Spirit will do for us in His operation upon our fleshly hearts. Hearts of flesh, in the flesh in the bad sense. Notice verse 13, it says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through what? Spirit. Do what? Mortify. What is that? Destroy. That's the strong way of saying it. Kill. Or put to death. But yes, kill. Kill what? The deed to the body. What's going to happen? You will. You will live. Is it possible to get rid of the deeds of the flesh in your own strength? No. no. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that those deeds can be put to death. But that requires a surrender. Based upon what? Faith in truth. And the fruit will be freedom from sin. Free to obey. How? Faith in God's power to fulfill His Word and that the Holy Spirit will put to death the deeds of the flesh. The deeds done in the body. On a continual basis. On a continual basis. But that is not all. That's not all. If you go back to verse 4 of chapter 8. And verse 4 is based upon verse 3. And verse 3 is dealing with Christ becoming flesh and overcoming sin. Verse 4 says, That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the 
Made flesh, but after the spirit. spirit. So as we continue to surrender ourselves to the will of God and the Holy Spirit fills us, the Holy Spirit not only will put to death the deeds of the flesh, but it will also bring in the righteous requirements of the law of God and help you to obey it. The righteous requirements of the law can be fulfilled in us as we follow on and follow the Spirit's leading. So yes, you can be freed, but you must follow. And you must continue to choose to follow, because at any time you can cut that off. See, friends, we're Seventh-day Adventists, aren't we? By Seventh-day Adventists, we have a doctrine that we hold to that completely and utterly separates us from Babylon. And it's a major doctrine. Can you tell me what that doctrine is, apart from the Sabbath? State of the dead. State, State of the dead. dead. Mm-hmm. Now, what do we believe when someone <laughs> actually dies? What do we believe? Sleep. Sleep. <clears throat> do they know anything? No. no. Do they have any uh, feelings? No. Do they return? They know nothing. They have no wisdom. They have no knowledge, those that go down into the grave. They don't talk. They have no emotions. There is no intelligence or intellectual power that is there. Nothing. Nothing at all. That's the state of the dead. Well, if the flesh is truly dead... If the flesh is truly dead, when temptation comes and begins to entice, what is the frame of mind that we should have based upon the doctrine of the state of the dead? Complete indifference doesn't bother us at all. Exactly. I know nothing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't affect us whatsoever. I know nothing. That doesn't appeal to me. No, I've died to that. It's gone. Don't even think about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what it says. I'm dead to sin. Mm-hmm. Or I'm dead to this world. Yep. And exactly. And alive in Christ. Exactly. And that's exactly as it has to be. Mm-hmm. And in that sense, it's not even a temptation. Mm-hmm. So when temptation comes, that's what we should, the mindset we should have. Mm-hmm. We don't believe in the immortality of the soul. What goes wrong? We don't consider ourselves dead. We actually resurrect the flesh. We go, yeah, I'm going to go after it. We don't consider ourselves as, no, that doesn't appeal to me. No, I I don't know that anymore. No, that's gone. That means nothing to me now. By faith. So the righteousness of the law can actually be filled in our lives. It can. How? By following after the Holy Spirit, who's going to lead you into all truth. It goes around in a circle, friends. And the truth sanctifies. So as you follow after the Spirit, the righteous requirements of the law will be fulfilled in your life. Remember, the law is truth. Psalms tells you that, 119. There will be obedience. The life will be purified. Holiness and cleanliness will be there. You will be reflecting the character of God by faith. As the Holy Spirit puts to death the deeds of the flesh, brings the righteous requirements of the law into the life. As you surrender yourself, make that choice, not my will, not what the flesh wants, but what do you want me to do, God? right now at this point in time First Thessalonians chapter 5 First Thessalonians chapter 5 <coughs> Notice verse 23. 1 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. The Bible says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Who does the sanctifying? God. Mm -hmm. He does, not you. God. How much does he want to sanctify you? Holy. Holy, meaning 100%. This is a, it's WH, which means 100%. He wants to sanctify you 100%. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved. How? Amen. Until when? Amen. So God wants to sanctify every single area of your life 100%. And then he wants to preserve you in that way, with that life, until the coming of Christ. That's what God wants to do. I'm not saying that that's what you need to do. No, this is what God wants to do in us. How? Through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Through the operation of the Holy Spirit. So we are sanctified by faith. Through the Word of God, which is truth. By the working of the Holy Spirit. As by faith you choose the will of God above your own. Allowing the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the flesh. And in its place, bring the righteousness of the law of God into the life, and thus enabling you to live an obedient life. Sin has no part in sanctification. None at all. Sin is the opposite. Sin has no part in sanctification. I just want to read a couple of quotes and then end on one verse. This is Review and Herald, January 18, 1881. It says, True sanctification is a daily work, continuing as long as life shall last. What does she mean by that? Many, many times, I have many people that say to me, yes, sanctification is a work of my lifetime, implying that, well, I will get there somewhere down the end in the future. Now, we're talking about this can happen right now. And God can preserve you that way right now. What does she mean by sanctification is a work of a lifetime? Testimonies for the Church, page 340. Sorry, and I've taken off the actual which volume of the testimonies it is. <laughs> Sanctification is not the work of a moment, an hour, or a day. It is a continual growth in grace. Why? Because of faith and works, page 85. Sanctification is not an instantaneous, but a progressive work. Notice, as obedience is continuous. That's why it's a work of a lifetime. Because at no stage should you stop. She goes on to say, Jesus, as long as Satan, or just as long as Satan urges his temptations upon us, the battle for self-conquest will have to be fought over and over again. But by obedience, the truth will sanctify the soul. She doesn't say give in over and over again, or give in and come back and give in and come back. She says no that it will be fought over and over again. Why? Because Satan is very real. Just because you surrender to Christ, it doesn't mean all of a sudden Satan is gone. He's an opportunist. He's, he's not a pessimist. It's like, okay, I didn't get him this time, I'll get him next time. This is why it is a work of a lifetime. Why? Because sanctification, notice here, she says that sanctification means habitual communion with God. That means you must surrender moment by moment by moment every moment of the day. Not my will, but yours. Not my will, but yours. Constant communion with God. And that happens for as long as life shall last. That was SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 908. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 350. True sanctification is harmony with God. 
But notice what she says, oneness with him in character. Be ye holy, for I am holy. But we know if this is possible, why? Because the Holy Spirit is promised to us. We can see what the Holy Spirit can do in the life. But notice this, Acts of the Apostles, page 51. Holiness is not rapture. It is an entire surrender to the will of God. It is living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Why? Because the word is truth and you're sanctified through it. It is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. It is trusting, there's faith, God in trial. We've spoken about that. In darkness as, in well, as well as in light. It is walking by faith, not by sight. It is relying on God with unquestioning confidence and resting in His love. The sanctification. And just for your own reference, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, sanctification brings us into unity or oneness with Christ, but also unifies the brethren. You want unity in the church? It's only going to come through a surrender and obedience to the truth. Simple. A sanctified life. It's the only way the church will be united. Not upon any other means. It will only be united, truly, in that way. But then, the question does come. Well, what if I sin? But what if I sin? Let's go to First John. Chapter 2. It's our closing verse. First John, chapter 2. First John 2, let's start in 1, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye what? Sin not. That's, that's, a, that's a loaded statement. John said, my little children, I write unto you that ye sin, sin not. Well, then that implies then, is it possible? Yes, yes it is possible. Yes. Or else he's lying under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It says, I'm writing unto you that ye sin not. That is God's ideal, to, to preserve you blameless until the coming of the Son of Man. That you sin not. But then notice the next two words. And if, if gives the understanding that it's not mandatory or it's not something that you don't have a choice in. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So what if I sin? Well, you can do two things. You can get there, you can beat yourself up. Mm. You can drag yourself down, you can persecute yourself. The devil uses that all the time because no one can persecute yourself better than yourself. <laughs> it's destructive. It leads to suicide. Mm. Which is what the devil would be happy, happy with. It's a good end result for him. Mm. You can go down that path Self-persecution. You can beat yourself up for what you've done and all that sort of stuff. You can do that, but it's not a good option. And it's not the biblical option. The biblical option is that we have an advocate. An advocate is one that pleads your case on your behalf. And that advocate is with the Father, meaning that he will represent us before the Father whose law we have broken. And he's the propitiation for our sins, meaning he's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He's the one that took the penalty and paid the price and shed his blood for our sins. And it's only through his blood that we find cleansing from it. That's chapter 1, verse 7. So therefore, when we have an advocate with the Father, if we would actually come to Christ 
In true confession and repentance, confessing our sin, repenting of it, Christ actually goes in as our advocate before the Father and actually pleads His blood on our behalf. Saying, Father, my blood. I paid the price for that sin. I took that sin upon myself. I have every right because of my death to cleanse him or her from that sin. Forgive them. Because they claim my sacrifice on their behalf. And Ellen White says that Christ stands there pleading and she says that he's there saying, my blood, my blood, my blood. Mm. Friends, if, if we do choose the flesh over the spirit, at this time, all is not lost. But it's as if. It's not when, because it's inevitable. No, if. Because there's all power that is given to us through the Holy Spirit's presence in the life. Friends, it is possible we're coming to the end of time but the devil would have us to believe that God is not all-powerful. God isn't interested in actually cleaning up all of your life. Just some of it. But it's okay, just claim Christ and everything is okay. But friends, you're either walking in the flesh or you're walking in the spirit. It's one or the other. You can't have both. God is merciful. God is gracious. That's why he's given us the spirit. Because he wants us to be ready for when he does come. And without the operation of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it will never happen. But with the operation of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it will happen. God promises it. It's a promise. He promises it. He says, I'll give you another comforter. The Spirit. He'll be with you and in you. He promised that this, could, that this is possible. That's where our faith needs to lie. Not in the words of men, but actually in the words of God himself. So let us be encouraged and hold fast our confidence, steadfast unto the end. Because if we do, there will be life eternal. Amen. 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 Our Father in heaven, we thank you that the promises are there, that we can hold fast but Lord, we know that this is not going to be possible unless we actually choose. And Lord, we need to choose your will, not our will. That your will would be accomplished in our lives and by faith, through the truth, the power of the Spirit, putting to death the deeds of the flesh, and bringing that righteousness of the law into our lives, that we do live that obedient life, that the life is purified. Father, may we learn to make that surrender at the time when it needs to be made, not just when it is too late. Father, may we live a life that is victorious, not, a li not living a life of just asking for forgiveness. We know you are merciful, Lord. We know you are gracious, and we thank you for that, and that we do have an advocate. But Lord, we know at some stage that will all cease. Lord, may we be preparing for that time right now. You have promised us. We claim that promise and we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.